welcome back to the Very Short Introductions podcast. From public health to Buddhist ethics, soft matter to classics and art history to globalisation, we'll showcase a concise and original introduction to a wide range of subjects, wherever your curiosity may take you. So here is today's Very Short Introduction. Hello, my name is Rana Mitter and I'm the author of Modern China, A Very Short Introduction. That is a title which basically covers a tremendous number of ideas, facts and figures about what may be the biggest and most important society on earth that the Western world still tends to know very little about. And that is the China of today and also, of course, the uh, journey it's taken to get to where it is today. Because there's so much one could say about modern China, how it came to be, the world's second biggest economy, how it came to be this immense military power, how it came to be a place that when it comes to everything from uh, poverty reduction to often a very um, problematic attitude towards human rights, that nonetheless it's risen to global prominence. When we think about all these questions, we have to divide them up into certain areas. And what I've tried to do in the very short introduction to modern China is to talk really in terms of three areas. One is the economic importance of China. And as we moved from a world perhaps just 30 or 40 years ago, when China was a reasonably sized but relatively small economy, through a phase where it's become the workshop of the world, to being a place where, where it's now not only the second biggest economy in the world, but also a major innovator in terms of science and technology. Well, that's a story that really needs a bit of explanation, I think. It links, of course, to one of the things that perhaps hits the headlines more than anything else in the uh, discussion of China, and that is the question of its politics. China is the biggest and most powerful authoritarian society in the world. There are others, of course. Uh, Russia has been very much in the news in recent weeks and months, but at the same time, China, in terms of its impact on the wider world, still probably has more of an overall global impact on politics. And yet, of course, it is an authoritarian society, one where a single party state, the Communist Party that's in power, is essentially the major vehicle, the major mechanism through which policy is put forward on everything from the uh, growth of the economy to the way in which China takes a role at the United Nations to the fact that many civil liberties have been heavily restricted and constrained in recent years. So all of these are aspects of a political project that looks very different from anything you see in a liberal democratic society. And I spend some time explaining just why that is. But I also spend quite a bit of time wanting to talk about culture because this is one of the things that I think is perhaps least understood. Of course, there is tremendous amount of um, censorship in China in terms of the cultural productions that go on there. But there are also amazing novelists who are writing science fiction that uh, breaks through new barriers, such as uh, Liu Tixin, uh, author of uh, The Three-Body Problem, one of the most widely read science fiction novels in the world these days, uh, in fact. There are artists, there are people making television shows, all of which go to audiences of tens of millions of people. This is a cultural scene that's well worth knowing in more detail, and yet we don't talk about it very much in the wider world. I have to confess that my own interest in these issues has been going on for quite a long time. I made the decision when I was 18 to actually go and study Chinese at university about 30 years ago, not at that stage because I thought that China was going to be the next great superpower. I wish that I'd had that power of prediction in my, my life, but I didn't have that at all. It was almost because in those days, China was so remote from the place where I grew up and live, uh, Britain, that I felt like I was taking a leap into an adventure which had really no connection with anything I'd ever seen in the world that I knew. But I have to say that the study of China, Chinese language, China society, Chinese history, which is my own particular area of specialization, has proved immensely rewarding over those many years. And that's prompted me to deal with some of the topics that I deal with in more detail in the very short introduction to modern China. One is the idea that of all the major societies in the world, Perhaps China thinks about its own history more than any other. And that history, particularly in the modern era, is often a very problematic, very troubled one. I'm thinking about the fact that a date that's still very much burned in the minds of you know, pretty much all Chinese who know their history from the mid-19th century is the Opium Wars, when Britain basically sent warships to try and open up China's borders to be able to sell opium and other goods, some, some more dodgy than others, into China's territory. 
And this essentially opened up not just the ports of China, but through this process of you know very violent imperial encounter with China, a whole century in which China was on the back foot, but also became driven into this modern world of international law, international trade, and thinking that came from places around the world, not just the thinking of the West, but also figures such as you know everyone from Mahatma Gandhi to figures like Kemal Ataturk, the uh, the great reformer of uh, of Turkey in the 1920s and 1930s. So that wider history is something that I suggest really underpins the way in which modern China has developed. And I pay particular attention actually to one period, the Second World War, which in the devastation that it unleashed on China, causing more than 10 million deaths, was a transformative mid-century event that helped shape the way not only for the communist revolution, the victory of the Chinese Communist Party that would shape China, you know, really ever since, but also the feeling that China is part of a trajectory of change from mid-century devastation and destruction to having taken this in some ways very astonishing path towards global power in the present day. I also talk quite a lot about ideas, some of them more modern, some of them more ancient. Confucius, the philosopher who lived you know, two and a half thousand years ago, has made a big comeback in China in recent years. And I talk a bit about why that is. Why would it be that the thinker who advocated harmony, but also hierarchy in society, might be so attractive to an authoritarian party state that basically wants people to know their place, even while they're growing the economy? But at the same time, I also talk about the impact of Karl Marx. Marxism, of course, very much central to the most powerful communist party in the world. Economics, which I mentioned before, is also one of the stories in which China is changing very fast. You might think about the Belt and Road Initiative, this very long standing, very wide ranging project that's existed really in the, the 2010s and into the 2020s to try and spread China's economic and therefore political influence in the wider world. It's changed form. Sometimes the Chinese are bringing investment to bring roads and airports in, uh, in African countries, for instance. They've also in recent years been moving much more towards health infrastructure. So a country like the United Arab Emirates has been taking on Chinese vaccines against COVID. And all of these bigger stories about how essentially China's economic power as the second biggest economy in the world comes together with the desire to really create a new global influence that it never had until recent years, but is now firmly attached to in terms of what it wants to do, what it wants to say in that wider world. And I also talk a great deal about the contradictions in modern China. Some types of freedoms, some types of freedoms are much more widely spread than sometimes people realize that the freedom to undertake your own kind of economic entrepreneurship. China is still a place where jumping into the sea, as they nickname it, in other words, starting your own business and potentially becoming a millionaire. In a few cases, China, I think, has more dollar billionaires than I think any society except the United States of America. So those sorts of economic freedoms are very real and are part of the story of the last 20 or 30 years. But other sorts of freedoms, political freedoms, freedom of media, freedom of speech, have been very heavily constrained. They've never really been completely free in the China of the Mao era, or indeed the era of Deng Xiaoping, the leader who followed after uh, 1980. But at the same time, there were eras, uh, the 1980s, and actually the late 1990s, early 2000s, when there was a sort of growth in civil society, you know, citizen groups, uh, even a certain amount of really interesting investigative journalism in China's press. But a lot of that has been really much more repressed in recent years as the government of China and Xi Jinping, its president, seek to control that kind of free thinking much more in service of a much more uh, unidirectional uh, voice for China in the in the world. And I explore a bit why that is and what the incentives have been both for the state and the party to push back against those freedoms and what resistance there is in some cases to trying nonetheless to open up the public sphere. So I hope that some of these ideas give you a sense that modern China it's a very complex place. One phrase that I use in, in the book, and I would still stick by, even though I wrote it some years ago, is that China is a plural noun. In other words, just thinking about China as an authoritarian state run by the Communist Party, it gets you part of the way, but it's not enough. It's also important to know about the artists and the poets and those who are seeking different sorts of paths in the China of today. It's important to understand how entrepreneurship and economic freedoms have created a different sort of Chinese economic miracle that on the one hand is of course part of the state project, but on the other hand, in many ways goes well beyond it as well. 
It's also important to understand China as an actor that's both a cooperating actor and a confrontational actor in the wider world. So in the first part, we can think about areas such as China being an essential partner in terms of global climate change, one of the most important issues that uh, is, is confronting us in the world today, but also realizing that China is beginning to become keener to make territorial and maritime claims in areas bordering it, such as the South China Sea, also wants to push for much more control over the internet, not just in its own territory, but in Chinese-governed cyber entities around the world. So many of these contradictions that make up the China of today are really things that need to be read about, thought about, and debated about, not just for those who are interested in China itself, but anyone who's interested in any issue in the wider world, from the future of the United Nations, to climate change, to understanding how we can broaden our cultural horizons just beyond the Western world. And I hope that that invitation, or maybe even challenge, has encouraged you to find out more about modern China, one of the single most fascinating societies on the face of the earth today. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you for listening to the Very Short Introductions podcast. You can subscribe to our podcast on your favourite podcast app to receive new episodes directly to your feed. All of our episodes, new and old, can also be found on SoundCloud and YouTube at OUP Academic.